Mission Impossible was really crazy, trying to track a horse through the dunes. If you ask them to do it again, like they could die. Anything past 30 meters, the danger level starts to accelerate quite rapidly. Walk away thinking, maybe I'll do something different next time, but don't burn a bridge. That always comes back to bite you. If you're feeling discouraged, keep showing up. You never know when that right moment is gonna come across and all of a sudden, you worked yourself lucky. You started not doing like drone operation, right? Like you started just making some videos for your youth group. I mean, going all the way back. I mean, I'm 40 now uh, and I started when I was 16. Um, and we actually, we started in, in uh, lighting and sound uh, in youth group actually. And one of the guys had gotten a hold of a camera. And so we started making music videos and one of the things that I noticed is the guy who knew how to edit ended up being the, the guy everybody liked, you know, because he's the one that knew how to make this stuff, right? And so I was like, okay, I'm going to learn how to edit. And I had, I had already like really been into computers a lot, um, but on the PC side, uh, like even building computers and, and different things. And so I decided I was going to learn to edit. So I was I learned I got a uh, MacBook Pro back when they were like the plastic uh, white plastic ones, you know. Uh, I got a MacBook Pro and Final Cut. It's like Final Cut Five, I think, is what I started on. And so imagine, I don't know how to edit, and I'm learning a new operating system, so PC to Mac, and learning how to edit at the same time. And, you know, like young people learn really fast. But even for me at 16, I was like, I almost threw it out the window several times. I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> but finally ended up figuring it out. Uh, ended up making a bunch of uh, small little videos. Uh, and yeah, the rest is kind of history. I just continue to do that. I loved it. Sports has always been, I guess that's a little bit more of the story as well. Uh, sports has always been the thing that I love shooting the most. So uh, I started with shooting snowboarding. Uh, and so I always had that connection in, in the extreme sports world. So then when I came to Dubai and, um, and uh, took over, well, was, I was the director for a, a new unit in, in Dubai film called X Unit. And we created all the content for X Dubai, which is mostly uh, extreme sports stuff. So, yeah. So you went from uh, being on staff, uh, creating videos from the media department to venturing into drone photography, getting really inspired, creating some, some maybe things that weren't massively common at the time. And then your friend hinted at the idea, Hey, come with me to Dubai. And then suddenly you had not, you had an opportunity presented to you. And then, uh, what, yeah, the crazy thing, that moment. the crazy thing, uh, you know, we we went from the airport to the Burj Khalifa where they are having a Jetman event. And so that was like my first look out at the city. And of course, mind blown, uh, not just with the city and the Burj Khalifa, but from Jetman Oklahoma as well. To Burj. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I met the boss that night and he didn't even he didn't even like ask me, do I want to work there or anything like that? It was like he's so confident. Like the first question was, are you Iranian? And I was like, no. He's like, you look Iranian. And then he said, uh, learn how to live in Dubai and you'll do just fine. And he walked away. <laughs> that was it. It was like, you're coming to work here. <laughs> so, yeah, it was crazy. So, you know, I came there to do drone stuff and I guess whatever else they needed. But mostly the, the drone thing was kind of my big reason for being there. And um, so, you know, Dubai film 
especially at, at that time, had some of the craziest equipment on the planet, like things that, well, things that it was only one in existence. You know, they they are the ones that uh, did the R and D, uh, paid the R and D to Ultimate Arm to uh, to create the Ultimate Arm. Uh, they're the ones that paid the R and D to to shot over to create the shot over. You know, they still right now they have zero zero one zero zero two. Uh, shot over um, so yeah they were like on the cutting edge of all kinds of incredible stuff at the time the 75 foot techno crane the, um, the ultimate boat there's still no still today there's nothing like the ultimate boat you know and like just crazy stuff like that and so that I was just in this world all of a sudden like wiener in a steakhouse you know like just feeling really out of place like how am I going to compete with these guys like a lot of these guys were proper Hollywood guys, you know, and so uh, I just kind of threw myself in it. Uh, anytime I could get my hands on uh, cameras or lenses, which honestly was was all the time, like the the camera room doors open. Uh, it very much was a place of learn whatever you want to learn. Actually, one day I remember my boss, he said to me, 40,000 dirhams per helicopter flight, no problem, learn, right? And it's it was just like that kind of uh, environment, right? Free ticket. So, yeah, yeah, it was just. So how but, much do you but, want it? But also high expectation, right? Yeah, like yeah. we're 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 giving you opportunity, but like you also have to deliver. You know, you felt the pressure, yeah. and um, I think my kind of big break at Dubai Film. Uh, well, I had two, I would say, really big breaks at Dubai Film. The first one was when uh, I was on uh, somebody else's job, and I had just one camera. It was a, a red dragon, I think, and. Uh, I just took the footage that I had and made an edit and sent it to my boss. And I don't, I'm not sure that he knew that I was an editor as well. And so he called me in the next day. He's like, did you make this? I was like, yeah. He said, okay, tomorrow go to this place, be here at this time. And it was just like a, a dock. And I got there at six in the morning and he just said, make me something nice. That's it. That's all he said. I didn't even know what I was shooting. So I took a red camera and went to, to the stock and they put me on a boat and I went out to the world islands and it was like hundreds of hot air balloons getting ready to take off. Right. And so I met the main guy and we went up in a, in a, in a hot air balloon. Uh, even, even that story is so crazy because, and this is like a perfect example of the, the kind of environment I was living in. So the weather was not ideal. As a matter of fact, the wind was blowing the wrong way. Uh, it was blowing towards Iran right and we wanted to go towards the uae and so um the hot, hot air balloon pilot was telling like the main guy uh no, no no this it's not a good idea weather's not right um i'm i'm not gonna take off and the main guy's like okay uh you're not the captain anymore he points to this other guy you're the captain now right <laughs> And here we go. <laughs> we took off. And sure enough, like as as we get into the air, the wind, uh, like this this main guy, he kept saying, "We just get up to a certain point, and the wind will be in the right direction." And it was like we got up there, and wind started blowing the right way. And uh, and so I'm shooting all of this stuff, and then all of a sudden, this helicopter appears. Right, all these hot air balloons are up, and and this helicopter is coming in, and it was Joseph, the guy I was telling you about. And I didn't know that they were sending a helicopter out, right? And so now uh, I have this this footage, and and uh, I make an edit, and I, I send it to my boss, and and it ends up on X Dubai uh, Instagram. Uh, and at the time, X Dubai was competing like head to head with Red Bull in terms of like uh, they had a whole portfolio of athletes, and and uh, it was all about the big stunts, right? And so. Um, he called me in again a few days later. He said, um, we have the World Air Games coming up at um, Skydive Dubai. Um, take any uh, crew, any gear that you want from Dubai Film. Make me something nice. It's, again, make me something nice. <laughs> so I did. I shot uh, five days. Um, we used all kinds of fun stuff. That was actually the first time... Um, that I used the Fujinon 75 to 400 in combination with the Phantom Flex. So of course, like these are the days where I was putting cameras uh, on things that probably wasn't necessary, but just because it was a cool camera, you know. So um, yeah, I, I made an edit, and same thing. Like that evening, it went up on on um, the X Dubai Instagram, and then 
the beginning of the next week, my boss called me in, introduced me to this, uh, this new guy. Uh, his name was Morgan. He's, he was formerly an athlete manager at Red Bull, also a former uh, Red Bull athlete himself. And he's going to be the athlete manager now at X Dubai. And he, he said to us, all right, we're creating a new unit. Because at the time, Dubai Film had two units, A unit, B unit. We're going to create a new unit called X unit. And you guys are going to create all the content for X Dubai. And then that's when, um, yeah, that's when it really just kind of took off all kinds of crazy projects. And then the next really big break, I would say, would be about a year later, there was some transition in the company. And we went from uh, being like more private to uh, like a normal company. And so we opened our doors to everybody. And because there was a lot of reshuffling, uh, I became the the like in-house director for Dubai Film. Uh, the the directors that were there before had kind of all all left, and so now we've opened our doors to the public. So all these commercials coming in and films coming in, and and so uh, and of course everybody's wanting to use the the amazing gear, right? And so all of a sudden, my boss was like, "Can you do this? Can you do that?" And all the time I was like, "Yeah, I can do that." And, and at night I'm like on Google trying to figure out how do you do this, you know. So, um, but yeah, thankfully there was never any train wrecks, and and that really was a, a right place at the right time kind of moment that wow. um, then put me in some just absolutely crazy scenarios. So, that's awesome. So what I, I'm curious, what what variables do you feel like allowed you? Like, uh, what, what decisions did you consciously make that allowed you to get to the place to where you were suddenly working amongst Hollywood filmmakers uh, in a sort of a, a completely new journey in Dubai? Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of confidence. Um, that certainly helps. Um, and a willingness to... Actually, the interesting thing about the confidence is um, if you work around proper film set guys... Uh, Hollywood style film set guys, the confidence doesn't always help you out because there's very much a system. There's a hierarchy uh, and you like earn your way up the, the ropes, right? You do this for a certain amount of time before you're allowed to do the next thing and so on and so forth. And so I didn't always make a lot of friends with the confidence um, in terms of crew. But uh, the, the confidence helped me a lot in terms of dealing with client and dealing with my boss, um, being willing to say, yeah, I can do that. I can figure it out, you know, um, and being willing to take chances. Um, and then over time, when the crew saw, OK, maybe he didn't uh, go the right protocol, uh, but he's getting stuff done. And then it was fine after that. So. Yeah, that was a big adjustment. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a film set kind of guy. <laughs> I don't. My philosophy has always been, uh, can the guy do the job? If the guy can do the job, uh, then let him do the job. Now, let me. Let, there is a caveat to that. Um, a lot of people can do a job until something goes wrong. And that's when you can distinguish, some, like somebody that's seasoned, somebody that's a proper professional from somebody that's a rookie is when things go wrong. When things are going good, yeah, a lot of people can do the job, but when it goes wrong and the person can still make something happen, then that's the the seasoned person, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's probably not the greatest scenario if things go wrong, but um, it's also good learning experiences. One of my favorite stories is, um, this uh, Bill Gates story where he had this executive that made like hundred plus million dollar mistake on, on one of the releases of the software. And Bill was in an interview and one of the reporters said, so are you guys going to let this guy go? And he's like, let him go. I just invested a hundred million dollars in his education. And I <laughs> love that. I think that's amazing. So I, I'm always a big fan of when you mess up, embrace it, uh, own it, learn from it and move on, you know? Um, because then you can say, uh, in the future, this is how we're going to do it. Uh, and we don't want to do it this way. And I've learned from experience, we don't want to do it this way, you know? So I think, yeah, you need to, you need to put yourself in situations where you're pushed, uh, and, and yeah, there's a chance you're going to mess up. And I like those situations. So 
I wonder how much people have paid for your education, Gary. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, thankfully, thankfully, no huge train wrecks. I think the... Uh, uh, okay, I have two. So I have two... Well, they weren't train wrecks, but I'll, I'll give you two uh, mistakes. So uh, one, I was directing a... Um, like a tourism film for Dubai Tourism. We were out in the desert and we were shooting in very low light. And this is like the A7S2, I think, it was pretty new. And you could hook it to an external recorder and get higher quality. Uh, and so we had been pra playing with that and, and getting some good results with it. So we decided to use this. And uh, we had an AC that had not, he had not been real familiar with that kind of scenario. That was a new thing. I mean, going, going to a, like a ninja recorder now is like so common. Everybody's done that. But back then it was a brand new thing. I don't even think it was, it wasn't ninja even back then. It was like called Odyssey or something, a completely different company. Anyways, um, I didn't double check his work and he had since, um, the menus like all the overlay into the recording and so we were recording 4k but you also had the menus so we had like 30 percent of the screen that was not usable uh because we recorded the <laughs> we recorded the menus right and i didn't double check uh and so that was a moment mm -hmm. where you know i could yell and scream at that guy all i want but i threw him into an environment that he didn't really know nothing about and if i would have just checked double check, then we would have been fine, you mm. know? Um, so that was a mess up. Uh, I mean, in the end, they just delivered in HD anyways. Uh, so it wasn't that big of a thing, but you know, your framing's not the same. The, the one that actually costs money. So I have been, especially in stunts, I have put cameras and lenses in environments that honestly were re really crazy. Uh, and, and the reason that I was able to is my boss one day said, listen, if you are, um, if you mess a camera up, if you ruin a camera because you are trying to get a shot that's really going to be special, fine. It's a part of the job. If you're screwing around and you mess a camera up, that's a different thing. Right? And so um, because of that, I had a lot of confidence to put these cameras and lenses in um, really crazy environments and never had one single thing go bad. And one day, uh, at, in the camera room, just doing a normal everyday lens swap, a 12 millimeter master prime slipped out of my hands and, and hit on the concrete. Uh, it like bent the frame and we had to send it in to get fixed. So the most normal, mundane, everyday thing is when I, when I mess the lens up. So yeah, but wow, besides that, uh, no huge trend So Yeah, wow. I mean, con considering all the crazy stuff you've done, <laughs> That's, uh, that's, uh, that's impressive. <laughs> so well done. You've done some crazy stuff. I've heard the, the helicopter story with, with, uh, with Tom Cruise. Um, and you've, you've had some world first. I want to hear some stories of some of the most exciting projects or some of the things that you've done. Mission Impossible was, was really crazy, mostly because it was, we were on a 50 to 1,000 trying to track a horse through the dunes. So we had gone up and done some test shots and the, uh, the aerial uh, stunt coordinator uh, told us what the, the director, Christopher McEwen, had wanted. And so we had gone up and done some test shots, uh, like 300 millimeter, which is already hard. Uh, and basically we track the, the horse through the dunes, lose him and pick him up again on the other side. And so we land and normally how it works is the footage goes directly from the helicopter to the DIT and the DIT will trim the footage only to the good shots. And because you're, you don't want to waste the director's time, like time is money on set, right? So we get called over to the director's tent and uh, uh, we walk in, it's Christopher McEwen and Tom Cruise. Now the pilot that I'm with, which is, uh, he, he's a legendary pilot, Andy Nettleton, um, just in terms of uh, shooting stunts and shooting films and all of this, absolute legend, uh, one of the best. But over all the years that I've worked with him, he still, to this day, calls me Jerry. And to be fair enough, I mean, my name is spelled like Jerry. So I can, I, people, it's hard for people to get that out of their head. But we walk into the director's tent and uh, he walks in first. I walk in right behind him and we start getting introduced. And he introduces me as Jerry. So Tom, Tom's like, nice to meet you, Jerry. Right? And, 
like there's it's like everything's rushed right so i don't I, I i feel weird taking the time to be like no 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 it's scary it's like no let's just move on you know no big deal so uh christopher watches the footage and tom's like whoa what lens is this and i'm like 50 to 1000 he finishes my my statement so the dude knows about lenses and so we start talking about this lens and then Christopher says, guys, uh, get me something that's tighter, like really get in there on him uh, and lose him in the dunes and pick him up on the other side. But you got to land on him. So we leave and, and we go back up and shoot some more stuff. And now we're like five, six hundred millimeters. And it's really difficult because it's not the tracking part. It's you lose them in the sand and, the, and then your screen's just brown, like you have no point of reference. So you come you out on the other side. Point? Well, Are you I'm feeling nervous. At this point, I'm with the uh, aerial stunt coordinator, so it's not, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely nervous. Uh, I want to get it right, but it's not like the guys yet, you know? And we go, we do this a couple times, and as we come out the other side, I don't quite land on the, I have to search a bit, where's the horse, right? And so we do a few loops trying to figure this out, and I said, okay, if we, if we start, um, if we start, at like five, 600 mil and we're nice and tight and we hit the sand and we widen out a little bit as we're going across the sand. There's this little bush up uh, towards the top there. And if I can see that bush, then I know I'm gonna land in the right spot on the other side and I can start pushing in again. He's like, yeah, yeah, let's try that. So we do that and uh, it works, it's fine. And so we go back, we land and, um, and we get called back to the director's tent like an hour later and they start playing the footage, but they don't play it uh, from the, from the very beginning. Uh, I'm sorry. They don't play just the good stuff. They play it from the very beginning. So they're, they're seeing the misses like right off the bat. Right. And so of course Tom's like, what the hell is this? Right. And then uh, I start explaining uh, what happened. He's like, so you got it. And I'm like, I've got it. No problem. Right. But of course on the inside, I'm like, I, I have to get it. Right. And as we're talking about this, um, um, McEwen is watching the footage and he's like, guys, we've got to land on the horse. And Tom's like, if Jerry says he's got it, he's got it. What are we standing around for? <laughs> right. And so then, you know, there's like a ton of people outside the tent watching. Right. And so then everybody kind of scatters and here we go. Like sunset's coming. Director uh, jumps in the helicopter with us. We start spinning it up. Well, let me and ask so, of you, course, you, you, you found the bush idea. You kind uh -huh. of found out as you were filming, right? Like it, it was yeah. something you kind of thought, okay, you know what? If I can land on this, then I can have a point of reference. So it was, yeah. it was fresh. It was like you had just done it, yeah, and then I you're, just telling, it, yeah. you're telling you're telling everybody, I yeah, I can do it. I only did it once. Uh, I mean, they did see it. They did see. Okay, yeah, he's got it. Um, so here, yeah, Tom's uh, getting on the horse, heading up into the dunes, and we're getting ready to take off. And uh, they had sent us a new AC, uh, camera AC. And, you know, we have our own tech for the shot over, but then the AC comes and checks all the camera settings and they do the, the uh, VFX globe and all this kind of stuff, right? And so we told the AC, uh, don't stick your hand in the system while we're booting up, right? Because it's, it's like a three minute process, the boot up. Uh, and remember, like this is hundreds of people on set, right? Like time is money, right? And so, Sure enough, like we start uh, turning on the system and, and midway through this AC sticks his hand in and starts making some camera changes. So now we have to start the process all over again. And it's like, and now Tom, you know, they all have uh, headsets on and stuff. And Tom's like, guys, what's going on down there, right? And, and now Christopher McEwen is like, guys, let's go, you know? So now, of course, I'm like, oh, great, <laughs> right? So anyways, we we finally take off we get up and i'm just like man i gotta get this i gotta get this and we start heading into the the first shot and for whatever reason uh christopher McEwen just notices that the lens is vignetting on this camera it's a it's a sony venice and it's a 50 to 1000 lens so it's going to vignette on the wide end and so uh that's probably why i didn't notice before is is you know we are more on the on the deep end and so now he's like, guys, why is this lens vignetting? And so now I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, like everything that could go wrong is going wrong, right? So I'm explaining this and here we go right into the shot. And so now I'm sweating bullets, man. And, and we punch in, he's like, get in there, get in there tight. And we punch in 
and uh, come across and I do what I did the other time and we landed on him. And then uh, he starts calling these next shots. We start going into all this other stuff. And uh, we get to this moment where Tom is like on the top of the one of the dunes and it's sunset in the background. And Tom's like looking out, you know, and we're just him and the horse and the horse like as if it was his cue, like stomps its feet in the ground. And so, of course, McEwen's like, yeah, baby, that's what we pay you the big bucks for, right? And so now everybody, we're all starting to calm down, right? Um, because we're, we're, what, the thing that you have to know is it's a video transmission to the ground. So every, all the crew on the ground are watching. And it's everybody has mics on, right? And so everybody's listening to everything going on, too, you know? And so... Now, like all the tension has started to, to, to calm down and we're, we're feeling much better. We got the shot. And so now because Andy's feeling good about it, he's like, hey, maybe we should uh, we could go around and reveal him from from the other side of this dune. And I'm like, mm, we're good. <laughs> you know, and Christopher's like, yeah, let's try it. You know, and so we go behind this dune and I'm like looking out the window. I'm like, uh, is he there? Is he? And Andy's like, don't worry, he's on the other side. And I'm like, don't worry. You know. Yeah, and we come up over the top, and he was there. And Christopher's like, yeah, that's awesome. Let's go behind this dune. And so we start passing behind a, another dune, and I look out the window. Because, you know, you, your head's in a monitor. You don't always know where you are. I look out the window to see, like, what, what kind of dune are we talking about? And we lose him going into the dune, and it's a long dune. I'm talking, like, four or five seconds of just sand. And so I'm just like, oh. Really, we had to end on this one? And so I say to him, uh, sir, we would have to be super lucky to catch him on the other side. He's like, hold it. And I'm like, Great. hold it, hold it. And I'm just like, there's no chance. <laughs> there's no chance he's going to be there. And we pop out the other side, and he lands right in the middle of the frame. He's like, I told you, I told you. <laughs> I was like, how lucky are we? Holy cow. So, yeah, we uh, we went back Amazing. and... and um, of course, there was a lot of celebration, and, and so that was a good. That was a certainly a highlight uh, in life was um, not just working with Tom Cruise on Mission Impossible, but doing a shot that was really difficult to do. Uh, anything on the fifty to one thousand uh, is just tough. And honestly, that's these days. That's what gets me excited. Like things that haven't been done before or are really really hard to do. We're working on something right now that's. Um, 27 meters underwater that's never been done before underwater with with cameras and for me it's like man this is literally the kind of stuff i dream about at night this is what i get excited about like i'm not a i don't like the idea of working on big movies or any of that stuff it's like oh it's like what would i be doing like am i going to do something hard then yeah let's do it but just the idea of making <laughs> movies is not something that i get excited about i want to do things that are like hasn't been done or it's really hard to do um, so, yeah, I mean, on the ego side of things, that's what, like, gets me excited. It's like, uh, I, want, I want to be somebody that when people think, uh, okay, this is going to be hard to do or can we even do it, that they, they want to call me. And so that's right. kind of in life what I'm my big thing right now, I suppose. Thing Swiss that Army Knife. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you didn't start off in helicopters shooting crazy uh focal lengths there was a moment when um you had the opportunity to potentially do it and you had said oh i i can do it yeah uh, wa wa walk me through that scenario because i obviously that was kind of the beginning and probably one of the only like if you didn't take that risk you wouldn't be able to do what you did in that moment yeah um so you know when you're when you're going to become a uh, aerial operator you often start on the ground first and so I was volunteering to do horse races and horse races are so boring and mundane. Like you're just going in circles all day or there's, there's a kind of a cross country version that's a little bit more exciting, but still it's just hours of tracking horses. Um, and I just volunteered to do a lot of that. That's the kind of work that most of the guys, they didn't want to do, but I thought, well, I want to, I want to end up in the air one day. And so, um, I did a lot of horse races and that's how I became good at, at tracking things. Um, and then uh, I became the director for the Jetman project uh, for the content creation side. And that is literally one of the hardest things on the planet to track. I mean, you have this man flying through the air, you know, at 
three hundred plus kilometers an hour. You know, it's it's uh, it's crazy. And so there, at the time, there was only uh, like two, yeah, you know, two people that uh, could actually do it. You know, and um, we were going to have to be kind of lean and mean, uh, our crew, uh, because we were traveling to some pretty crazy places like China, for example. And so I opted for, uh, uh, to gain another crew member in a different position. Uh, I just said, you know what, I can do the helicopter stuff. And they're like, um, are you sure? <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. I can do it. You know? Uh, and it was hard. Like I was, that's some of the hardest stuff I've ever, like your hand starts to cramp, you're sweating, you know, uh, just trying to, because I, I think what makes it so much harder besides them moving really fast. They're small, they're moving really fast, but these guys are doing things that are incredibly dangerous. Like they can, you, if you ask them to do it again, like they could die, you know, like it's, it's, it's really heavy stuff, you know? And so you don't miss shots. Like you, if they're going to do something, you got to get the shot. And I think for that reason, it was so much uh, tougher, but uh, I felt like, um, yeah, I felt like I could do it and, and yeah, it went fine. Uh, I mean, I certainly wasn't as good as the guys that had been doing it before, uh, right off the bat, but very quickly, um, I, I became good at it. So yeah, that was, yeah, uh, but, that was a crazy, but it, crazy uh, thing in life for sure. But that was something like you don't get access to do, like you had to kind of push your way in, into the line. Right. I, I want yeah. you to like, walk, walk me through that scenario. I think it's so inspiring just to hear like the fact that you were like you know what i really want this and i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to fight for this yeah i mean it certainly was a fight um you know uh, management is ve they were very good at like okay you've proven in the past that if you say you can do something that you've done it and you've delivered so they weren't uh, they weren't a problem for me it was it's the the people or other people around you you know that uh, you know, there's always politics involved, and um, and of course, if if that's been your job before, you want to keep your job. So the the guys that had done it before it was very tough. But yeah, it was just um, it wasn't purely. Of course, I wanted to learn how to do it. So there was, uh, I suppose, you could call that the ego side of of wanting to do it. But more importantly, there was the practical, economical side of like, ah, I need a, I need. Uh, another camera operator in this position and I only have so many slots and so I need to suck it up buttercup and and make it through it so mm, that's exciting so tell me about the uh what really gets you excited and fired up these days is obviously deep dive creating some stuff underwater I uh, when any, you told anything. me about yeah when you told me about that the process for filming underwater it blew my mind because I had no concept for how much more complicated it becomes, not only diving underwater and dealing with, you know, air pressure, but also ha operating a piece of equipment underwater. Yeah. Yeah, anything underwater uh, gets me excited. <laughs> I just love being in the water. Uh, so I'm a technical diver. Um, and yeah, okay, so when you start to go to depth, so I would say anything past 30 meters, it starts to, the danger level starts to accelerate quite rapidly. And the reason is because um, you start using different gases, especially past uh, 40 meters, you're, you're using mixed gas now. And so, um, and you can, you can essentially, what happens is how your brain re responds to these gases. Um, it makes, it's like being drunk. And so now you're drunk underwater. And so you're not always making decisions in the best way. And so you have to manage gases at certain depths to be able to function cognitively, basically. And this is why, um, it's so important to, have a safety whenever you go diving but even more important whenever you're you're going to depth because you start you can start to do things that's like don't make sense like all of a sudden you're staring at this beautiful fish and you've never seen a beautiful fish like this before and this fish is so amazing and you're at 55 meters and every minute that you're at 55 meters is like 45 minutes of of uh, decompression time right which equals gas right and so things compound quickly. And so when you say decompression time, you mean you have to decompress before you, uh, surf. Yeah. You can't just go to the surface. Yeah. Uh, your blood will literally boil like the, it will bubble up. Right. And so 
you have all these things going on. I mean, this is even part of uh, becoming a technical diver. They will take you to depth and they will expose you um, to to gas in a way that will make you a little bit on the edge. And then they start causing you problems. Like they'll take your mask away and they'll uh, shut down your, your tanks and or they'll disconnect a hose. And you have to stay calm and figure it out. You know, this is how you even get certified to be a technical uh, diver is that you're not going to be somebody who freaks out underwater, right? And so now imagine you have all of that and you're trying to film something. You know, uh, especially when it's like you have to light it and the person has to act underwater. Right. And then all of that at depth and you have to manage gas at the same time. And so for me, it's um, the fact that it's really hard, really dangerous. Like that's just what makes me excited in life. You know, like just being able <laughs> to go uh, into these scenarios that like, well, just knowing that there's not many people on the planet that do stuff like this, you know? And so, uh, man, I get so excited about it. And, and to be honest, it's another uh, right place at the right time scenario because the guys that run deep dive um, are literally some of the pioneers in the industry. Like they're the ones that put their bodies through testing these gases at certain depth to figure out what works, what doesn't work, you know? Um, they're li literally the guys that wrote the book on, on how to do this stuff. And so wow. that was another, um, just right place at the right time that I got to do training and, and, uh, and shoot with these guys. Um, so yeah, super grateful for it, but that's certainly the thing that, that I wake up in the morning and, and get excited about, you know, so. That's exciting. So, uh, we'll be looking forward to your underwater diving course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah when's it coming out <laughs> yeah we've been talking about doing one it's just the amount of commitment uh it takes from the person coming to do the course uh is not always understood you know and so there's a lot of people that are like yeah yeah i would do that and you start talking about what it actually takes and they're like mm, maybe next year <laughs> you know? so yeah it's it's a lot of work so yeah that's that's, that's so cool um, so I've got some uh, some recapping questions and principles. I'd love to dive into a little bit of uh, a little deeper into your story and, and the, the the sort of lessons that you've learned over the years. Obviously, you've 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 dealt with culture clash. Um, you're you're a passionate American, uh, as I am, <laughs> and um, you told me that you know. Or I'll put it this way, or I'll ask you the question before I say the, the lesson, but like how dealing with culture class, what have you learned in terms of what's 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 important for you having longevity in your career? And um, what would you, you know, encourage any up and coming uh, passionate filmmaker? Um, what principles have you learned that have yeah, kept sure. you in the long term? Um... Yeah, I mean, first of all, you have to learn to deal with heartbreak. Um, you know, we we have all these ideas in our head of, oh, this is my film, and this is how it should look, and no, it has to be done this way. And then you start working with an agency or a client that's like they also have visions of, of how it should be. And very rarely does the director or DOP get his way 100%. And when I was young, I fought against that really hard and uh, didn't make friends in the process, you know. Um, because it, it's just in my head like, oh, no, it has to be like this. If it's not like this, it won't be good. Um, as a matter of fact, there was one. <laughs> wow, this is so embarrassing. There was one time that uh, I was sitting with a client and they wanted to do something that really, honestly, it was nonsense. And I said to them, um, OK, we'll, we'll do that uh, just so you have it. But then we'll we'll do it the good way as well. You know, and it's like, ah, oh, you Ooh. Yeah, it's just so uh, spicy. And of course, yeah, it's very passive aggressive, right? Um, and it was fine. Like, yeah, it, <laughs> thankfully, that was a scenario where the client wasn't offended. But it's like I didn't need to say that, right? <laughs> just do it, but you don't have to say it, you know. Um, so, yeah, you have to learn how to deal with heartbreak, and you have to uh, learn that uh, di diplomacy always uh, wins. Uh, if I'm when I, if I'm directing a project and I'm looking at the resume of, of all the options of DPs, a lot of people think uh, that I'm looking for styles like, oh, I just want to get the style of this guy. No, I'm actually considering uh, who can get the project across the finish line. So 
I'm looking for somebody that um, either I've worked with before and I and I know that I can get along with them and that we're going to get a project across the finish line, or they have a track record of getting projects across the finish line. Um, that for me is the most important over anything else um, is that you can deliver, you know. And if you do it uh, with flair and style on top of that, hey, great, icing on the cake. But the reality is, like, you got to get a project to the finish line, you know. And when guys get really stuck on the flair and the style and it has to be this way, then they struggle to get a project to the finish line. And that's terrible, honestly. That's the, the worst ever. So, um, yeah, I think when I was younger, I really... Um, was locked into that it has to be this way this is my vision this is what i want to see uh and and even as a director probably man i have my lights were shutting down on me it's okay you still look great i was really kind of stuck in that uh way of doing things and yeah as i got older i learned you know what it's okay we're going to make the best that we can make. We're going to get her across the finish line. We're going to be proud. Um, maybe it's not exactly how I wanted it, but we got the job done. Uh, and I think the the big thing was when I was young, I wrapped my identity up in what I created. Whereas now being older, it's like, ah, I'm a creative. Sometimes um, uh, the right perfect scenario comes together that we can make something that we really want. But most of the time we're... Uh, we're trying to make the best. You know, very rarely do you walk onto a film set and everything goes right. As a matter of fact, I, I, can, I can't even remember a time that everything went right, you know? And so, um, yeah, you have to be somebody that uh, can make the best of all kinds of scenarios. Uh, you're not yelling all the time. When I first started directing, uh, I think because I was probably a little bit insecure, if somebody messed up, I would yell. Yeah, I think um, the big thing is when I was younger, uh, it was I wrapped my identity up in like what I would create, and um, yeah, you realize when you get older that um, it has nothing to do with who you are. You know, like it's uh, for me nowadays, like being focused on family, spending a lot more time with them, um, being a good dad. Um, my identity is much more in that, and you know, yeah, I go out every day. We make the best that we can, uh, of course. I have a vision, of course, I have a style that I want to see uh, come across, but um, diplomacy works much better on getting to the finish line than, than throwing a fit and yelling at people. And um, yeah, that, that you, know, you don't ever get anywhere uh, being that guy. So, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions just to make sure we get everything we can before time runs out. Sure. How. Um, <clears throat> How important is it for gear, buying gear, gear as a filmmaker? Yeah, it's not. Uh, sorry, I'm going to burst people's bubbles. And I love gear. Uh, I can sit for hours and, and talk about gear. But the reality is that um, the story, um, how you connect uh, people to the story matters more than anything else. Um, so gear is secondary, uh, especially the camera. Uh, you're going to get... Uh, how you're lighting a scene should be first. I mean, you have story first, obviously, but then how you're lighting a scene should be second. Uh, then lenses third. Uh, le a lens creates much more character and is much better at telling a story than the camera. And then the camera fourth, um, in that order for me. Uh, and I don't, I mean, certainly, you know, you can make all kinds of cases for, you know, this camera being able to do whatever it is, you know, that you want it to do. And, and it's legitimate cases, but like in terms of priority of what matters, um, yeah, the camera's pretty far down the list for me. So, and, so, and this is coming from, I, th I, I think the reason that I was able to land there is I worked in a place for seven years that had the best of the best. They had everything. And so I, I could play with everything all the time. And I realized in the process that uh, it didn't help that much, <laughs> to be honest, you know? So, yeah. I think um, some interesting things about you is you owned a red, uh, mm. you brought it to Dubai, and it mm. sat and collected dust, right? And yeah. <laughs> um, you've you've touched the best of the best. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is true, but some, sometimes you gotta, you gotta touch the best in order to finally land <laughs> somewhere in a yeah. reasonable spot but in those bigger productions you're gonna have access to that equipment and that's also the difference of like you know 
that I've realized is like, you know, if you have a proper production, you're not necessarily all you can rent any equipment you need for the production. And that's, that's, that's an important part. Um, I also think it's, it's useful. Well, one part where it is useful, of course, is just getting experience. Mm -hmm. Um, so having a baseline, I think like what you had described in terms of having the bare essentials in terms of, uh, the focal ranges, um, to have experience with that. Yeah. But yeah. Um, okay. So next question, uh, in-house or freelance, what, uh, what would you recommend in terms of someone, you know, wanting to pursue this dream full time? Do you feel like, you know, uh, there's pros and cons? Do you have an opinion about that? Or yeah, think, that's know, the same question to me as a film school or no film school. It's like, uh, what, what kind of personality type are you? Because you can give pros and cons for both sides. You know, if you're somebody that loves school, then go to film school. Uh, you're going to make connections that will last a lifetime. One of the beautiful things about film school is you make connections that uh, it only takes one person in your group to make it and your whole group makes it. Uh, so that's amazing. Admit to protocol and climbing the ladder and the specific way that they've set up. And, and uh, I'm smiling and smirking when I say that, not because um, I'm saying that's a bad way. It's just not my way. I 100% I understand why they do that. It makes sense, but it's not, it doesn't fit me, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, in, in the same way, um, I would say if you are going, if you're just starting out and you're wanting to try to, to figure this whole thing out, then yeah, go, go work somewhere and uh, see the process, see how they do things. Um, you're going to learn a lot uh, being on salary somewhere and, and, and being that guy and then when you're comfortable then then do it yourself if you have a lot of confidence and and you think you can shake the bushes and make it happen do it you know that's it's to me that's a personality question so so a filmmaker looks at you and says man i want to i want to be there at some point in my life um well what would you say is the recipe for getting to i wouldn't say the top but the top you know, this this question is uh, so funny because it makes me think of uh, one day I was listening to this preacher and he does this like, he's this old gritty New York preacher that does uh, like hardcore uh, on the streets kind of stuff, you know? And uh, he was he was preaching the sermon and he said, this guy come up to him uh, after the sermon and said, I want you to pray for me and uh, to have your blessing. And he's like, okay, I'll pray for you. I'll pray you get shot in the face like I did. <laughs> <laughs> when I heard that, I was just like, oh, that's amazing. It's so true, though, because it's like, you know, people like they want the magic pill or they want the the um, the if I could do this one thing, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's just not how life works. Uh, now, I was lucky to be in the, the right place at the right time. But at the same time, uh, I worked myself lucky. Uh, this is, is a, a saying I picked up from a, a co-worker a while back work yourself lucky. So, um, yeah, you, a lot of people will see like, oh yeah, but you had so much opportunity and you were able to do this and able to do that. And, and they don't see all the work and effort and staying up, uh, through the night, learning how to do things. And I mean, I started when I was 16 guys, I mean, I'm 40 now. So it was, it, it was a lot of hard work. Uh, and it's only kind of later on in life that it's like, oh, I'm an overnight success. Yeah, right. <laughs> overnight. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, nothing in life comes for free. It's not easy, you know. Um, now, I'm huge on uh, this whole idea of being in the right place at the right time comes through relationship. Uh, so work yourself lucky and make connections. Um if I ha if you force me and twist my arm to say what's the the one thing, then I would say relationships. Meet a lot of people, shake a lot of hands, uh, do stuff for people that maybe you don't get paid the best for, but it creates a good relationship. Actually, there's a there's a guy here in Dubai that he was telling me, uh, and he has he has a very large company. Uh, he doesn't need to do free things, but he did something free recently for some organization, and it took a lot of his manpower to do it. Um, just because he wanted to make connections. It was a kind of organization he wanted to connect with the people that were going to be at this event. So he did this whole thing for free. And sure enough, he made a connection that ended up in multiple different jobs, you know. And so mm -hmm. here's somebody who 
they don't have to uh, do stuff like this, but he understands the power of a relationship, you know? So, yeah, I, I, if you force me into giving the one key piece of advice, it's meet a lot of people, build a lot of relationships, you know? Be known as a guy that is not going to fight everybody, but is a problem solver and is going to get the project to the end. So. In your own words, do not burn bridges. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, and I learned the hard way, you know, like you get mad about a scenario and you're like, I'm never going to work with this person again. So I'm going to tell them what I think, you know, and then guess what? You're never going to work for them again. But an opportunity uh, came up that you could have worked for them again. And the, the, the what makes it hard is you get down the road a couple of years and you don't even remember why you were mad at each other, you know, and yet you're still not working together because at some point you're mad at each other. It's so dumb. Like, it's so dumb. So, yeah, you have to learn how to put your big boy pants on. And, and even though you're having a full on disagreement about something, say, you know what? How can we how can we solve this and walk away thinking maybe I'll do something different next time, but don't burn a bridge that always comes back to bite you. So I think, you know, I've I've heard um, over chatting with you a lot. A lot of what you've advised is actually in terms of conflict management, relationship building. Um, you've talked about not burning bridges. You've talked about. Do not try to solve conflict over text message. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've talked terrible about, idea. Yeah. Um, you've talked about, of course, um, making yourself indispensable in terms of working hard, being reliable. Um, and all of these things seem so mundane, but they obviously are the, the fundamental sort of work ethic that have helped you, put you at least put you in the right place at the right time when, when the time came, right? Yeah. Um, so it's inspiring to see, of course, a career that spans um, longer than just a few years um, and how you've managed to, uh, you know, the lessons you've learned uh, along the way. Um, you know, in the words of John Maxwell, he says, uh, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's a true. Beautiful, beautiful way of, <laughs> of quantifying, you know, people get lucky when they prepare uh, and the opportunity comes and they're ready when that moment yeah. comes. Um, so going back to the idea of like, what does it mean to make it? Do you feel c creatively fulfilled on bigger productions? Uh, what does it mean to make it? Um, I have a story for you actually. So I'm from the U S uh, we, we don't, uh, until recently soccer is not, has not been a big thing. I mean, now it is, but and it's only happened in like the last year, right? So uh, one day we get a, a call and we need you to direct this project. It's going to be a, a celebrity, but we can't tell you who it is until you come in, sign an NDA, and we have our first pre-production meeting. So I go with my team. We go in and uh, they say we're going to be making a, a commercial for Messi. And we kind of talk through the plan and then we leave. And uh, a colleague from the UK is like, are you, are you excited? And I'm like, what is, is he good? <laughs> I mean, I had no idea. Right. Um, and I make and it? <laughs> it's, and it's literally the goats, you know? And so I have been able to be in situations, uh, shooting some really cool people. Uh, Will Smith, for example, I mean, not just Will Smith, Will Smith, shooting Will Smith on the helipad of the Burj Al Arab, you know, like, these dream scenarios that I think my opinion is it's not because I'm overly creative. It's not because I have this amazing style. It's because I have a long track record of getting projects to the finish line, trust, you know, uh, reliability. And I don't, when I look at my stuff, um, I don't like, I don't feel like, oh, man, you've made it because uh, you have this amazing creative eye. No, I think I've, I've made it because I've worked hard. I've delivered projects that um, some of them have been quite tough. Some of them have been really grueling, but we get projects to the finish line. And, and I really think uh, if you want to be somebody who makes it, then you better be somebody that, that delivers, that gets projects to the finish line, not a diva that's always griping about your style or your way or your camera or your, I got to use these certain lenses. Like, man, that's all rubbish, you know? Like be somebody mm -hmm. who people trust uh, when, because the reality is in the, the scenarios that I just described, I promise you, Shane, 
I didn't get the call for Will Smith or for Messi uh, or for a mission because uh, I had an amazing style that they wanted on that project. It was trust that I was going to get the job done. It's really that simple, you know. So, yeah, uh, you want to be somebody who, who makes it, then, then be somebody that people can trust uh, to get the job done. And I think um, when you make the transition from being overly concerned about um, methodology and style and, and wrapped up in like, this is who I am uh, as a creative and, and you start just living life. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's family, you know, when I made that transition from um, everything was about the, the content I was creating to like, no, I want to be a good dad. Uh, creating content's cool also, uh, but I want to be a good dad, more importantly. Uh, what happened on set was I calmed down. Things that were a big deal were not a big deal anymore, you know? Um, and that's important because we can make uh, little tiny things a huge deal on set that just really are inconsequential in the end, so, yeah. So you would say that finding fulfillment for you is part of a, a process of growing in your own identity and understanding that, you know, fulfillment at the end of the day is actually being a good dad yeah. and, you know, raising a family and being a husband um, yeah, exactly. and and what you're doing as a filmmaker let, uh, let me uh try to summarize what i'm hearing you what i think you're saying is you know it, it took getting to the top to realize it's not as maybe glamorous as as you had anticipated or it's not the the thing that fulfills you is that is that what you're saying yeah for sure i mean that's not um the closest thing that I can get to like waking up in the morning and thinking about something on a film set is shooting some hard stuff underwater. That certainly makes me excited, but, um, yeah, that's not normal stuff. Like underwater stuff's like, uh, that's not something that everybody's, you know, calling you up for. So yeah, for me, um, that's, that's where I found joy in life is being a dad, uh, being a husband, um, having friends that actually want to be around you. I remember, um, well, wow. so I worked with a person that when we were together, we would run over people unintentionally, but we, we, we kind of had this methodology of, um, in our industry, people can tell you a lot, it can't be done, or you can't do this, you can't do that. And we kind of had this way about us, uh, that we said, no, we're going to do it no matter what, like we're going to be the people that get stuff done. And in the process, uh, we unintentionally could run over people, um, kind of a, either get on board or get off kind of uh, attitude. And when we weren't together anymore and I started working at a different place, there was a, a person that I had done some projects with back in the day. And they said, you know what? It's nice to work with you in a different environment because to be honest uh when you were in that environment when you were with that person you were an asshole and at first i was like haha kind of laughing it off you know but my wife was there with me and i looked at her and she's like and it was like oh man i had no idea like i wasn't trying to be an asshole but but i was right and so yeah you uh, and yeah, you need people, uh, in relationships in your life that are going to be honest enough to tell you when you're being an asshole, you know? So, um, cause we all can be at times. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, so two, two questions, two hit fire questions before we've got five minutes. Um, number one, how do you handle failure, failure and being hard on yourself? What, what would you advise to someone who really wants to make it and it's just being beat down mm. by challenges and, you know, competition in life? Mm. Yeah, I wish I had some, like, wise, sage stuff to say about that. But Toughen I, I really, up, buttercup. <laughs> yeah, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, life hits us all and it sucks sometimes. Um, but yeah, you got to keep getting up and, and doing the same thing. You know, I'm doing this uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu with my son. And one of the things that they say all the time is keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up. And one day you, you're a black belt all of a sudden, right? All of a sudden, all of a sudden is never all of a sudden, right? It's uh, the fact that you kept showing up, you know? 
So yeah, I would say, uh, it, yeah, if you're feeling discouraged, keep showing up, you know, um, you never know when that right moment, uh, is gonna, is gonna come across and all of a sudden you worked yourself lucky, right? Worked yourself lucky. That's yeah. the, that's the, that's the key word for the, yeah. for the episode. Um, give me your hot take on making it as a Sony ambassador. You finally had validation for the amazing skill sets that you Yeah, have. you know, that's interesting because uh, I never really set out to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I, it was more of a photography thing. And I am a photographer, but I don't feel like I'm that level of a photographer. So for that reason, I've never had it in my head to become an ambassador. Uh, and it's only fairly recently, like within the past, past five years or so, that that's even become a thing, a cinema ambassador. Um, and so when they gave me the phone phone call, uh, I was I was really already doing it. Um, I was al already using their products um, on a regular basis. I mean, my go to camera is is the Alpha One, for example. And before that, it was the uh, what was before that A seven three, I think. Um, yeah, A seven three. And so uh, that's I love shooting that way. I love just a small camera I can throw in the bag that can do everything. It will take good photos. It's going to take good video. It's going to take good slow motion. Uh, if I need the high res 8K, like it does everything, you know. Uh, and so I was already using the Sony stuff a lot. And for them, um, they said just basically you just keep doing what you what you're doing. Um, for for them, I think it was because I had the cameras and a lot of weird, unique scenarios uh, that was attractive to them. But these days, uh, it's a lot of teaching, um, which I never really thought I would do. Uh, but I love it. Like, I'm older now, so I love teaching teaching young guys. It's fun. Uh, especially the ones that are like, what camera should I get? And I'm like, come with me, Padawan. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I love it when the when the light bulb goes off and they, they finally realize, oh, it's not about the camera. And I'm like, I'm an ambassador. I should be selling cameras, right? But, yeah, it's not about the camera. Like, it's it's about uh, just being excited and going out, creating content every day. Ah, here's one for you. Uh, one day at Dubai Film, we had a film school come through the office. And one of the students asked this question, how do you guys make so much viral content? And I was like, how do we make so much... We just make a lot of content. <laughs> like we don't, we don't, we don't have the recipe for viral content. Like we make a lot of content, and every once in a while, something goes viral, and that really is the secret. Like people always want to know, do these five things, or here's your three quick tips, or it's like no, just get out and and grind and make some some stuff, try new things, experiment, and you never know. Like uh, at some point, you make something that people are excited about. And sometimes you don't even know why they're excited, but they're excited, you know, and it goes viral. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you just got to make content at the end of the day. Um, that's my number one piece of advice, actually. For uh, So I did a, a, a personal class uh, a few nights ago. And the person uh, started with, okay, what camera and lens should I get? I was like, no, 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 no. You have an iPhone, right? Go make some stuff with your iPhone. Make a lot of stuff with your iPhone. And then come back and let's have that conversation, you know, because it's not about the gear at the end of the day. Um, it's about getting out and making stuff with what you have, because that's when you actually learn the things that matter. So as a Sony ambassador, you would say that it's it's not necessarily a validation of of who you are. It's just it's there's not a lot as of people. people hype it up to be. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of people that have. Um, that are capable, um, they have the skill set, they have the track record that can be ambassadors. So uh, I'm not unique in that sense. There's a ton of people out there that, that could do the same. Um, so yeah, I think that was probably a relationship thing as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's, no, it's fine. I don't want to make it sound like it's not a bad thing. Like I get to meet a lot of people through the process, through teaching and like when we launch a new camera well when we launch a new camera that's a, a really cool part like you get the camera before way before everybody else. i mean uh, i had the burano like when was that it was like october last year you know so um yeah that kind of stuff's fun especially if you're a gearhead like me you know um so yeah that that part's cool but I, yeah i think the the most valuable thing that i get from the ambassadorship these days is just the relationship part the getting to mm -hmm. meet people across the world so yeah 
Gary, thank you for the conversation. It was uh, super fun to be able to do this. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was awesome. Thank you for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed it and you want to hear more and grow in your own professional journey, then I invite you to join me over on YouTube where I'll be posting more there as well. And also on Patreon. My hope and goal is to help give back to the filmmaking community that has helped me in the journey. And if you know someone who I should interview, then let me know. I will see you in the next video. Cheers.